You're listening to TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour with your host, the director of Dixie Heritage, Dr. Ed DeVries. Hi, my name is Dr. Ed DeVries. I'm the director of Dixie Heritage. I'm also the editor of the weekly Dixie Heritage newsletter. One of the subscribers to our newsletter is Sid Secular. Sid is also the editor of his own magazine called The Conservative Informer. He's a political activist who lives in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, just across the border over in Maryland. Uh, he's very active on several fronts. I get very interesting emails from him on almost a weekly basis, so he's somebody who I've wanted to talk to uh, for quite some time, so I decided to use the launch of our podcast as an excuse to get to know Sid a little bit better and to find out about the things that he's doing. I've got Sid on the phone here. And so let's just get started. Uh, can you hear me, Sid? Oh, okay. Sid, when I first got an email from you, and I don't remember when that was. It might have been two years ago now. I don't know how long you've been a subscriber to the Dixie Heritage Newsletter. I, yeah, as soon as I saw it, I, you know, I, I signed up right away whenever it was. I don't recall. Maybe two years ago, something like that, I guess. Yeah. But but I saw your name, Sid Secular, and that's not a name that you would see. That's not a common name like, say, David Smith. No, that's for sure. And so is that your given name, or is that a, like a pseudonym that you've, you've taken on in your activism? No, it, it, it's a given name. And um, <clears throat> I looked into it. There was actually a knight from the Middle Ages who had that name. Okay. But, I, I, there is nobody else in the world but with that name. I know that. <laughs> there is one other person in the world with that name. There is, really. There is. Now, I don't think that it is his given name. But if you type in Sid Secular into Google or Bing, you will get a black man in Virginia who is the head of an organization. I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's, it's like a humanist, atheist type political activist organization. You know, one of these groups that's always trying to take religion out of schools and American Humanist Association. That might be it. I, I should have looked that up again before we, we did this call. But yes, if you uh, if you type in Sid Secular, you'll see he comes up in his picture with his blogs and everything. I, okay. I'm guessing he's black. He may be Middle Eastern. But so you're not the only Sid Secular uh, in the world. You probably want to ma- let everybody know you're not that Sid Secular. Yeah, that would certainly. Uh, that would certainly be something I should uh, tell anybody who's curious about my name. Mm-hmm. It's it, Sid Secular, uh, not Sydney Secular. Is that what you what I should look up, or does it matter? Uh, just look up Sid Secular. I'm actually in front of my computer right now. I can do it. Okay. You send me actually a lot of uh, interesting emails. You have no idea how many of the emails that you send me end up uh, resulting in my searching the internet and looking for things, and then it becomes uh, something posted in the Dixie Heritage letter. Yeah, I noticed you took up on my stuff, you know, and posted a lot, so I appreciate that. Tell me a little bit about yourself, Sid, for perspective. I know uh, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s right now, and, and I'm not asking you to give your exact age, but I, I know you're a, a widower. I'm guessing you're at least a few years older than I am. Yeah, I just turned 77 yesterday. Okay, well, happy. Um, I'm looking at the stuff about me here. <laughs> uh, there's new stuff on here that I haven't seen before, so I'll, I'll be checking that out. Okay. Uh, I'm looking for this black black man you're talking about. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, an atheist conference. But it's a safe assumption that your last name, secular, in no way implies that you're an atheist or that you're irreligious. I'm going to give away something about my background. I try to not give it away because people have the wrong, they'll immediately think the wrong thing. I, I'm, I was born into a Jewish family and I divorced myself from Judaism at a very early age before I was bar mitzvah, so I'm not really truly a Jew in, in the religious sense anyway. So, But uh, I do have a, a little bit of other ancestry besides. Jewish, European Jewish background. I mean, I did an Ancestry.com search, and I have a little bit of Scandinavian, a little bit of Finnish, a little bit of Spain-Spanish background, a little bit of this and that. So I know very little about my background. I have a grand. My mother's mother 
comes from a famous family of rabbis called the Babads, B-A-B-A-D. I found out about that like two days before my uh, my last contact with my family occurred. You know, so I don't know really much of anything about the background, but there there is an article in one of the Jewish encyclopedias on that. But I I studied all kinds of different religions, atheism and Christian uh, religions and Christian identity, uh, prophecy in particular. You know, the Book of Revelation, the Book of Daniel. Uh, that type of thing, and so I think I got a very good knowledge of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and you know I, I just study all kinds of different things, occult things, and reincarnation, and ancient civilizations of North America and elsewhere, like Atlantis. So it's safe to say then that you're not an atheist. Uh, if you could, Sid, tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the activism that you're involved in, the political activism. The activism and, and uh, to I, save I our heritage and our culture. started getting involved in the uh, movement or the, uh, what you would call the alt-right, but it wasn't called that at the time. Back, back in the 1990s, uh, I joined Amer oh, I went to uh, American Renaissance conferences starting in about 1998, I think it was, and right on through 2010, where they closed down the conferences in 2010 and just... Uh, I don't want to start chasing them all over the the area to find out where they finally wound up having the meeting, which they did. But you know, it wasn't worth going through all of that. But you know, I was I'm a steady uh, proponent of what we're after. I I just plug away at it. You know, I, I don't give up like a lot of people do. I think we've lost so many good people who just don't. Uh, keep up with it that they they find something they don't like or they have a clash of personalities or they, they're scared because of job concerns, whatever it is, they usually don't tell you. Specifically, Sid, I'd like to ask you, how did you get involved in Southern heritage issues or the activism for things regarding monuments and Southern heritage? I know you had told me in one of the early emails that we had exchanged that you were not uh, born a Southerner. So exactly what happened that got you involved in the Southern heritage battles? I was a regular New Yorker. I didn't know anything about South. And um, I married a lady who we called the Belle of the South. She was a descendant of the first uh, colonist or settler in Tennessee, as far as I know. His last name was Odell. I think it was, I'm not sure, William Odell. I mean, there was a whole clan of Odells. And uh, her name was, her maiden name was Mildred Vance. And uh, throughout the history of the family, there's always been an educator or, or a teacher or an educator. You know, uh, she was a, an art teacher, and her uh, mother was an art was a teacher. Or you know, and, and it goes back to, into the 1700s. They were all teachers and community leaders in their area, which was East Tennessee. So, how did the Gaining of appreciation for your wife's heritage ultimately lead to you becoming an activist for Southern Heritage. The former leaders of the SCV, Nick Griffin, who was a former, you know, CIC. I think we met him at at, at some kind of commemoration over there, and he took my my wife, who had a really nice Southern accent. He really took up with her that way, you know, and started being. We started getting very friendly, and he introduced us to the Museum of the Confederacy and Hollywood Cemetery and Jefferson Davis and so on and so forth, and we made some visits down there. So uh, that's when I started getting involved and interested in Southern issues. And uh, I'm a member of the League of the South, and, and uh, I get their papers as part of my package that I send out. And I'd like to get more involved in their demonstrations when they go around, uh, you know, having flag waving or complaining about whatever it is. Sid, I want to talk a lot more about your activism here in a minute. I also want to talk to you about immigration. I want to talk to you about some of the political climate uh, that we're in right now, talk about President Trump, some other things. But before we do that, uh, let's cut to a commercial. 
God Bless America Again conference is coming to Ocala, Florida, January 26th and 27th. Starts at noon each day at the Southeast Livestock Pavilion, 2282 Northeast Jacksonville Road. It's going to be a time of prayer, praise, and testimony and some of the best in Christian gospel music. Everyone's invited. Tickets? You don't need no ticket. It's a free event. Call 352-250-1771 for more information by them. Yesterday, I found out Michael Hill, the president, the director of the League of the South, Twitter kicked him off. It did what? Twitter kicked up uh, Dr. Michael Hill, the director of the League of the South. They yes. kicked him off Twitter. They kicked his publicity officer off of Twitter. And they also deleted several, even of President Trump's tweets that were supporting uh, Southern Heritage because they've determined that they're kicking everything off Twitter that's considered hateful. Well, they're doing it to all right-wing organizations. Now, American Renaissance has suffered that just in the last several days. They, th- their Twitter account was eliminated, and, and they, have, they can't accept credit cards uh, either. And, and the Barnes Review, of course, and, and American Free Press are, are, are suffering because of that. People to submit orders are so used to doing it the easy way by credit card. Movement. Every freedom movement or right wing organization has been affected by that because they, they had, there's a master list some, somewhere, and, and whoever is is the uh, sponsor or you know uh, the host for uh, the payment system for the credit card system or, or bookseller like Amazon has this list and, and they're one way or another uh, discriminating against us. And, trying to hamper our ability to continue as an organization. Amazon has cut off or something like 200 books from circulation. I know several of the emails that you had sent, have sent to me over the last couple of years have had to do with social and cultural disintegration. Yes, that's, yes, that's what we're facing with uh, the left-wing assault on, on uh, American civilization or society. We got the New World Order people that are, you know, not giving up. They just, they, they know they're about to win, so they're really increasing the activity that they have going on. As, as uh, the Confederate campaign, they have to eliminate our statues and monuments is, is like, you know, a, a, a representation of that. It's, it's probably the first in a series of different things that they have in mind, and they're attacking uh, Euro. European American statues like Columbus, and actually they're trying to get the Peter Stuyvesant statue in New York eliminated because he supposedly had some activities going on around 1650 or 60 that were discriminating against the Jews. And you no, know, I have an article that showed that that's not the case. He was just trying to do his job, you know. So I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. They actually try to eliminate a statue of Joan of Arc in New Orleans. But, I mean, that's the extent. And, of course, if we let them, they'll take down the statues of Washington, Jefferson, and our founding fathers. If we just don't do anything about it. Well, they're already starting to take down statues of the founding fathers. Yeah, they're starting to do that. We can put up our own statues. I guess that's a, that's a possibility. You're from Maryland. Yes. Uh-huh. And how many years have you lived in Maryland now? Uh, since 1969. Okay, so you've been there quite a long time. You're you're entrenched into the culture of Maryland. I'm, I'm entrenched in in the, uh, the what we call the Berkeley of the East, in the most liberal area here on the East Coast, probably except for Boston, I would suppose. Well, my uh, wife grew up uh, just a few miles from where you live now, and of course she grew up there as well. And she just cannot wrap her head around the fact that in Baltimore and in other places in the state of Maryland that the statues and the monuments to uh, Chief Justice Taney are coming down. Um, yeah, anybody who has any association with uh, promoting slavery in their point of view is, you know, is subject to having their statues and his history erased. That, that's what it's coming down to. Well, as you know, Justice Taney had absolutely nothing to do with the war between the states or the Confederacy. No, that's so. Uh, but somehow or another, he, he he's, a, he's a Southern white, so must have had a decision that went against the blacks. So, I mean, that, that's all they need. Well, he was the he was the author of the Supreme Court's Dred Scott decision 
Of course, you know, the people who want to tear his statue down, I do not think that they ever read the Dred Scott decision. Because if you read the Dred Scott decision, you know, of course, he says that by the law, according to the law, that a a black person uh, did not equal a whole person according to the law and so forth. But if you read the decision, he's saying that if Congress were to change that, if new legislation would be adopted to change that, that a future ruling of the court would be totally different than the one that he was issuing at the time. And so, if anything, I think that he was trying to give black people a path forward. If anything, I, I think mm-hmm. that they, they, owe, uh, they owe him a great debt, but, you know, they don't see it that way. Because how, how dare him, you know, uphold the law as it was written and suggest the law be changed rather than just being a judicial activist, I guess, is right. bound to. But yeah, nothing, nothing is safe anymore. But I know my wife can't, can't wrap her head around the fact because, you know, growing up there, everything was named after him. And so I guess they're going to have to change the name of Taneyville now. They're going to have to change a lot of things as, as this purge continues. You know, I've got to ask the question, when this purge is over, what's going to be left? Is there going to be anything left? Billy Roper, who, who's a nationalist and an individual, he believes the country's going to break up, balkanize along racial lines, and the great heartland will become a white country. And, and areas, other areas will become the domain of the other races, like the South or the Lower South will become a black area, and Southern Florida will become a Hispanic area, along with the, the Southwest, which is in the process of becoming uh, either part of Mexico or a new country called Azotlan, A Z T L A N, which they've been promoting for a long time. And with the rate of uh, immigrant. Uh, Movement into the Southwest is almost a sure thing. I don't know what we're going to do. And, of course, if Cal Carving didn't get anything going, we might have a white country in the Pacific Northwest. To find a word for me. Of course, you know, this word has been very maligned in the mainstream media. Find this word for me. Define the word nationalist. Uh, a nationalist believes that a country or a nation should be composed of people similar to one another and have similar interests. I think the Founding Fathers should have made that more plain. The, the, the uh, statement in the Federalist Papers that, you know, we're developing this constitution for our posterity should have it's been interpreted to mean our the people that were there at the time, their ancestors, which were really British colonials, you know, should, should be the ones uh, to inherit the country, so to speak. But it never was really defined like it should have been, I, I think. So uh, we want to go back to what we had at one time, which is a cohesive, homogeneous population. A common culture, a common background. The nationalists believe, that don't have to be necessarily white nationalists, but believe that people should have a lot of things in common. They can't have that in a multicultural country. That's what we're after. We, we want to bring the country back to the way it was, where we can feel comfortable once again. So would you consider the word nationalist to be a patriotic word? I, I would call it a patriotic word, yes. That's, that's true patriotism as far as I'm concerned, yes. So then why is it that the media is constantly trying to villainize that word and that sentiment? There's a thing called civic nationalism that is a kind of nationalism that doesn't take into account uh, a person's uh, racial or ethnic background, all a person has to do is believe in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and they're considered, you know, a patriot or, uh, you know, an American, uh, a good American, but uh, that's not going to work anymore. All these immigrants can raise their hand and, and take the oath, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, a minute later, they're fighting with each other or trying to take the country over. So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You know, when I was for years involved in different political activities, in my opinion, for example, be it Bill Clinton, be it Jimmy Carter, be it somebody in the media, Ted Brokaw, Dan Rather, you know, somebody be it in the, in the, in the media, on television, maybe a news commentator or a politician, often I would question their goals for this country. I would question their procedure. I would question their policy. I would question their ideology. But I never questioned their patriotism. In other words... I totally disagreed with Bill Clinton's vision for America. I totally disagreed with his foreign and domestic policy. But I never questioned whether or not the man was a patriot. Right. But in the modern era, 
I seriously question, in fact, I totally refuse to believe that there's any patriotic element to Barack Obama whatsoever. I totally refuse to believe that there's anything patriotic about Hillary Clinton whatsoever, which now causes me to have to go back and wonder, well, you know, 20 years ago, was Bill Clinton really a patriot? Right. That, I feel exactly I, the same and, way. And, and I watch Wolf Blitzer, and I watch Anderson Cooper, and uh, Don Lemon and these guys, and I don't think that there's a patriotic fiber in their being. So I, I've gone from not just questioning their policy or their ideology, but literally questioning their patriotism itself. A am I correct? Yes, I, I, I would agree. I mean, this agenda, uh, this New World Order agenda has been around since the 1700s, and it's just infiltrating all sectors of, of our uh, society and uh, gotten to a point where there's no inhibition, guilt, or shame about having these positions of wanting the country to uh, basically disappear and a new type of society replace it. Uh, you know, uh, it's been a goal of these organizations, such as the Council uh, CFR, Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberger Group, and the several other groups of that nature uh, get together frequently and talk about their agenda for the world, and they collusively try to uh, implement the UN's uh, Agenda 21, which is now called Agenda 2030, for a global uh, government and, and uh, the elimination of borders, sovereignty, any kind of nationalism or a national feeling for that matter. They want to make the world just one big country and uh, they want to really eliminate religion entirely if they had their way about it. I'm reading a book right now by a man named Chet Flynn, who has a lot of experience in this area. Uh, it, it goes into all the machinations which began with the Illuminati, the Masons, and so on and so forth, and the Rockefellers, and the Bilderbergers, and the Rothschilds, and uh, people like that who fomented the Russian Revolution, and actually the French Revolution was probably the first one that they fomented. And that was a lot worse than the history books make out. Probably 300,000 people died in, in that. You know, just they, they just killed people at random just for the sake of killing people, just to be good anarchists and destroy the current order. But, of course, you know, that only went so far, and, and Napoleon put a stop to that. But that's, that's the kind of agenda they have. This guy, Bill Ayers, who was Clinton's uh, advisor, I believe, that was his goal. So, I mean, uh, you're right about Clinton being... Uh, unpatriotic and, and, and Hillary being likewise and uh, people who belong to these democratic administrations wanting to uh, destroy us uh, you know the way that the Democrats in Congress vote as a block without any exceptions is a sure indication that they're you know they're being coached or they have this kind of mentality that they want to destroy everything they won't, don't want to compromise like the, recently, you know, on the health care bill, there was no indication that, of any kind of desire to compromise over it. You know, that's an indication that we really have very little to, uh, possibility of, of overcoming our differences. Well, I've never seen it, it, so hateful <clears throat> or so vicious or so just overwhelming. Uh, in their just outright assault on everything American. And it's it's happening, of course, in our attacks on the Confederate monuments. It's happening in the attacks on the Constitution. It's happening, as you talk about, in, in politics and everything that the president has tried to bring up legislatively. They've just violently opposed it. It happens in the fact that, that every day is just, if you watch CNN or if you watch MSNBC, it's just this uh, rabid attack against everything of its patriotic, everything that's decent, everything the president's trying to do. I've, I've never seen, in other words, I did not realize that the enemies of this country were so capable of so much hate. And I'm just going to say it, I don't know that the people on our side are even capable of that kind of a intensity. No, we're, we're basically uh, good people. We like to we like to compromise. We, we, we like uh, we have a certain morality. We expect other people to live up to that morality. 
we don't expect people to be violent, you know, to get their way. We expect the democratic process to be used. Uh, you know, uh, we, we we expect to uh, elect people and not complain about whoever we, you know, not cry like babies or try to impeach whoever we elect, give them a chance to do what they have to do and work to, to maybe change the uh, party and control next time. But we don't do it through violent means or through constant demonstrations or interference with freedom of speech of, of people who want to talk on campuses or have political rallies. So you're, you're right about that, that's for sure. You know, we're, we're, we're in a different era now, and I, I think people have to realize that. I mean, we, we can't just talk about taxes like the Tea Party does or some kind of minor uh, issue. We have to get to the heart of the matter, which is saving our country, you know, in the form that we know that the country should be, you know. Try to return it to what it was and what it should be. So, I mean, they should realize that there's a race war almost in effect. Right? There is a race war in effect, actually. But, of course, it's not publicized by anybody except us on the old right or on the conservative right. Of course, it was the left that started that war. And what we guess we could call the mainstream conservative media knows that. But the reason that they won't say anything about it, as you say, is because they're afraid to be called a racist, of course, those of us who are in what you call the alt-right or the far-right, we're accused of being a racist every day just for trying to point out the obvious. Uh, the uh, number of white people that are killed by blacks is just astronomical, and you don't hear about that anywhere. There's any number of thousands of uh, white women who've been raped by black men, but uh, there's maybe one or two white men who've raped a black woman, and this is according to the FBI statistics. It's just non-existent. And there's a book called The Color of Crime by Jared Taylor, who's the president and leader of American Renaissance. There's been two editions of that one. just came out recently that gives you all the stats from the FBI itself on, on the crime committed by all the minorities as compared to the white crime. And it's just unbelievable, but you don't hear it anywhere because the controlled media will not let it out. We really do have a, a, a war going on here. And, and there's no sense beating around the bush about it. So then you think that all of the cultural purging and all of all of what we're seeing now is ultimately going to lead to, should, we, should I call it, the next civil war? We're going to have to go through a, a civil war first before we can resolve this issue. I, I think so. I think the federal government is not going to let us go on our own. You know, There won't be any secessions going on without them stopping it without having a war over it. I, mean, I don't see how it could happen otherwise. So uh, there's a couple of supposed movements right now beginning, according to this man, Billy Roper, which I, I started subscribing to his uh, emails just a few weeks ago. He says that there's an eastern Tennessee, there's a state of Franklin, and that there's, there's a movement for uh, a new country in northern New England called uh, New Albion, and, and then uh, there's a movement in the Ozark called Ozarkia that he thinks is the, you know, the nucleus of a new white state in the future. I don't know anything about these organizations, but I, they seem to be suddenly arising. Uh, we don't really know how it's all going to play out. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Right now, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. If you love listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, then I know that you'll love reading The Barnes Review. The Barnes Review is one of my favorite magazines. I began reading The Barnes Review long before they became a sponsor here on the program. In The Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There's just not a more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So if you'll visit www.barnesreview.org, that's www. Dot barnesreview.org, you can find out how you too can become a subscriber to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review by mail, or you can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review electronically in PDF editions, or you can subscribe to receive both. That's what I do. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review.
in, in the Barnes Review, in the last issue of the Barnes Review, the Defending Dixie issue, which was the September-October issue, of course, I'd sat down with John Friend, and he had interviewed me, and I uh, had the privilege of appearing prominently in that issue. But I see here that you also had an article in that issue. I had a, Somehow they missed me in the table of contents, but my article's on page 44. It's a review of the book, Maryland, My Maryland. Uh by Joyce Bennett, and you know she's a descendant of, of the first settlers in Maryland. It's just about how Maryland was at one point before it became a Yankee place. And basically, that's what it comes down to. And uh, it, it discusses some important Maryland uh, contributors to the uh, war for Southern independence, what they did, you know, and so forth. Just a couple of people are unknown now, but they were important military people at, and political people at the time. So that that's in the book and it's sold by the Barnes Review, you know, you, you said, in the latest catalog for the Barnes Review is one of the items. So I've heard that you've been selling for the Barnes Review, not selling subscriptions, but selling um historical artifacts to raise money for the Barnes Review. Tell me a little bit about that. Somebody donated some military or military or whatever you want want to call it, you know, a collection of uh, things and I went around and sold it to them and got a small commission. So, you know, I, I know uh, Paul for a very long time. What kind of stuff did you sell for him? Uh, medals and, and uh, ribbons, just war medals and war, you know, all kinds of awards. That's that's popular, but but just a, a variety, really. You know, but I say half of it at least was. There was a guy who said he was a real expert who wrote the book on it. He says, I should have waited for him to come and look at it. He said he would have given me more, but, you know, it's my first experience with anything like that. So, as a matter of fact, I have, I have a, a sword. I have no idea of its provenance, provenance as they call it. You know, it, it's kind of difficult to identify, and I'm going to – it's from Portugal or Spain, you know, and, and it's – I thought it was a Civil War sword, but apparently not. I found it on a farm, actually, out in the Burkittsville, Maryland, in the area where there were a lot of Civil War battles. It's very heavy. You'd have to, you'd have to be an old Viking in order to be able to handle that with ease. It, it seemed like, you know, really bulky and heavy. I say I had an artifact like that years ago. It was a World War One helmet. Really. One of the German helmets with the pointy thing on the top. Yeah. <laughs> My great-grandfather had taken it as a war souvenir. And when I was a little kid, he gave it to me. And my whole life, that was at my grandparents' house. And then when my grandmother died, my cousins went in there and raided everything. And, of course, I was living a 1,000 miles away at the time. So by the time I could get there, it was gone. And I'll never see it again. I never try to figure out if I'm making any money on it or not. You know, it's just something I like to do, and hopefully, I'll make a difference in, in the, you know, what's going on in the world. Well, from what I can see, Sid, you are making a real difference, and not just in the work that you've done uh, with the Barnes Review, but also, as I understand, you're the editor of your own magazine, the Citizens Informer. Tell me a little bit about that. Do you get the Citizens Informer? I believe you've been sending it to me. I've been emailing it, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. There's an email version. There's a hard copy, and then there's an email version, which has an additional seven pages to it. That's what I've, That's so easy to do. I just send it to people who I'd like to have, you know, to see it or maybe even subscribe. There's like three. We have three editors. We all put our heads together on what goes into the paper. Well, the other two editors, Earl Holt, the president of CFC, see, and uh, Valerie... Proto Pappas, who's a writer, a very good writer. I've known Valerie for some time now. I just, I say met Earl. I got an email from Earl a couple of days ago, and that's the first time I had ever heard of or, or, or known anything about Earl. She's written a couple of articles in, in the uh, Free Magnolia, and and then she, she was one of the email correspondents of, of a lady named Nancy Hitt, H I T T. So I picked up on her email and contacted her, and that's how I got we you know we started corresponding and she started sending me articles and they were so so great she she's written a lot about Lincoln and about the South. It's just super good 
And I'm hearing rumors that the Citizens Informer is about to expand, that your whole organization is about to expand. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is that a true rumor that I'm hearing? We have plans to make our paper, the Citizens Informer, the paper for the American Freedom Party uh, in the paper in the future. We'll follow up. Well, that'll be looked into more in the near future since probably at the convention we have next June. We'll probably work that out. So many print publications are going out of print or they're simply transitioning to all digital editions where they're entirely available online, no longer actually printing issues that you can hold in your hand that are printed on paper. And while that's happening, I understand that you're not only expanding your print magazine, but you've actually worked very hard to keep other print publications that would have otherwise gone out of print or gone strictly digital to keep them printing paper editions. Tell me a little bit about that. Not that people are just uh, don't read anymore. They'd rather read the uh, articles on the Internet. But we have to go... Uh... We can't rely entirely on the internet because it might be taken down. We have to keep our hard copy publications going. I mean, that's very important. Uh, Barnes View, of course, being the best of the you know, a lot as far as the revisionist standpoint is concerned, and the American Free Press too. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad American Free Press seems to be carrying on. They got a uh, uh, you know pretty good sized readership that helps them a lot. So that's very good. Uh, so, uh, some of these publications teeter on the verge of uh, disappearing, and a couple have disappeared in the past. We had one called the Middle American News that died out about 2010. It was devoted almost exclusively to immigration uh, questions. We had the Idaho Observer, which was dedicated to the New World Order type of issues. And the Nationalist Times was on the verge of extinction in 2015. I gave them a contribution which kept them going. I, I don't want to brag, but I gave them uh, a hefty contribution, and two other people pitched in, and so they've been carrying on now. But they have difficulty continuing, always begging for money. So if people can dig in their hearts and wallets for a good cause, that's the one to, to, to do, you know. E either give us some support now or put us in, the w in your will. I mean, <laughs> one way or the other, we, we still would like to have what we need to continue on with the battle, you know, for the future. As someone who has spent the greater part of his adult life as a writer, I definitely appreciate all the work that you've been doing to keep these great publications in print. But what I want to do right now is I kind of want to move back to politics. I know a lot of what you're publishing in your magazine, a lot of what you're sending out in your emails, a lot of what you're talking about uh, with different groups is immigration. Uh, what do you think is the go-to source for immigration, be it a website or a print publication? There's a, there's a lady who, who maintains a site called Refugee Resettlement Watch, Ann Corcoran, and she puts out two or three emails every day on what's going on with refugee resettlement all over the country and, and uh, all the problems attendant there with, you know. These refugees are just foisted on local communities without their knowledge and consent. There's about nine refugee contractors who actually, it's 90 percent taxpayer funds that are paying for this, paying for the uh, paying big salaries to these agencies to do this resettling. With these CEOs getting anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand a salary, so it's you know it's just ridiculous what's going on. Well, you know what I read in the Wall Street Journal today: the federal government uh -huh. prosecuting a Chinese doctor. The reason they're prosecuting this doctor in China, and he makes approximately fifty thousand dollars per client, and apparently he had over four hundred of them last year. Mm -hmm. And what he does is apparently Chinese and Russian people can go to Saipan. It's a little island out in the Pacific. The, uh -huh. the, the United States took control of it during World War II, and so it's a U.S. territory. And they can go to Saipan without any type of a tourist visa. Hmm. Interesting. So, like you yep. and I could get on a cruise ship and you know walk off the ship in Mexico, 
and not have to have a tourist visa? Well, they can go to Saipan and be there for up to 45 days without a tourist visa. Totally legal. And so what he does is he gets pregnant Chinese ladies and they pay $50,000 and he flies them to Saipan. They check into his clinic. They give birth to their baby. They vacation for a week or so while they recover. And then they go home with their baby. But what they've just done is their baby is now a U.S. citizen. It's the old anchor baby type thing. Yep. And so now, uh, if at some point in the future the political climate in China changes and they want to get their child, or even if the child's an adult, depending on how many years may pass, that child will automatically be able to go to the United States because it's a U.S. citizen. And in many cases now, if the parents had a goal of immigrating to the United States, they've just fast-tracked that because they have a child who's a U.S. citizen. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are because you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States, the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. And if you're like me, you do not rely on the mainstream media to obtain this information because, frankly, you know that you just can't trust them. Fortunately, there is an alternative news outlet with a long-established track record for honesty and integrity, and that is the American Free Press. AFP is the preeminent alternative independent news source for honest, hardworking, truth-loving Americans. AFP is the antithesis of the controlled, lamestream media. AFP is employee-owned and has been so since its founding. Because of that, AFP never has and never will allow advertisers or special interests or big money to dictate what appears in the pages of the American Free Press newspaper. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. AFP covers the stories and tells the truth that the lamestream media is frankly scared to touch. And AFP offers real, on-the-scene reporting and commentary, the likes of which you will never see in the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or just about any other lamestream news source that you can think of. That's right. There's only one national populist news weekly staffed by an unsurpassed team of veteran investigative journalists who will dare to rip the veil off of many of the major news stories that are being censored and suppressed by the big-money-controlled media monopoly. And that's the American Free Press. AFP publishes exciting, in-depth, uncensored news and information that's grassroots and patriotic, information that Americans need to know in order to combat the growing police state. AFP stands firmly against the New World Order, and against those who are working to establish a global plantation under the rule of a powerful few. In short, AFP is your voice. If you have any doubt why they want to silence AFP, you must be relying on the lamestream media for your news. And folks, that's a big mistake. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net and find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. And we're back as we come into our final segment with Sid Secular. We were talking about immigration before the break there, Sid. Uh, I understand you've been doing some things locally in Maryland, in Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area, specifically to address the immigration issue. Could you tell me a little bit about your local activity? I've, at I've attended a couple of uh, political rallies by Maryland politicians, uh, legislators, state legislators in Maryland who, who are uh, on our side, if you will, to a certain degree. There's, so many, there's several different uh, immigration reform organizations that are not really racist, if you will, but they're trying to reform the immigration system to make it uh, more tolerable for American citizens. People are so afraid of the word racist, 
or being associated with one that, that they just freak out. I'm, I'm going to throw a name out there since you mentioned Maryland and politicians. Michael Perotka. Uh, yes. I, I've, been, I've been at his office, had meetings there. They may still, for all I know. And I went to two of them where uh, Tom DeLisi gave a lecture. You know Tom DeLisi? No. He, he's... Uh, 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 He's in the forefront of the movement against Agenda 21, against uh, taking all our private property to meet the New World Order or UN rules and regulations or program. American Policy Center is the name of his organization, and he puts out uh, literature, and he goes around the country giving lectures about the extreme environmentalists taking away our property rights. That's his main focus, <clears throat> and he gave a lecture there. Mr. Peruka has a, a very extensive uh, Confederate library, or so, you know, a library about Southern issues. There, is very, very impressed with that. And as a matter of fact, we did attempt to start a chapter of the League of the South. We had two or three meetings. Did you know Michael Peruka back? Uh, this was. I had Michael Peruka and and another gentleman by the name of Dwyer speak at a CC event that I was hosting. Was it Don Dwyer? Dwyer, yeah. The John Dwyer, the professor from... John Dwyer, I think. I think it was John Dwyer. John John wrote the introduction to one of my books. He's a great guy. And Michael Perot, uh years ago, I met him back when he was running for president and actually ended up... Yeah, that, we had him speak, well, you know, in the campaign uh, for, for president when he was running. He I, came I, down and gave us a talk. I traveled the country stumping for him. Uh, for about six months during that that presidential campaign, I'm I'm trying to get a uh -huh. hold of him. Um, if you if you've got a, a good email address for him, uh, let me know. I tried to contact him on Facebook and I didn't hear back from him. I'm really hoping to get him as a as a guest on the podcast. Well, he got into local politics and he's becoming, I think, more politically correct. I try to contact him myself. He was he was on uh, uh, some uh, council for Anne Arundel County, Maryland. Well, he went some kind of local political post in Anne Arundel County, and I the city there was an article. There was an article about that in the Washington Post, and I, I they had a contact uh, information, an email, or, or I believe it had an email address for him, and he never did answer the email I sent. So he may be just going along with the usual program instead of. I know that Michael's still stirring the pot because he just gave Roy Moore a very sizable donation to investigate voter fraud. Well, that, that's great. You know, this, we have enough information in order to issue a very comprehensive report on that subject right now. We had an article in our paper, Citizen Former, that summarized the whole issue of voter fraud, you know, not that long ago. It's a matter of comprehensively summarizing it and presenting it in the right venue or to the right people. And then, you know, maybe we can stir the pot some more on that before the next election, you know, to make more people aware of it. It's, it's gradually coming out as it is, you know, because there's voter force going on everywhere. So it's like everything else. The, the controlled media controls everything, and it's very hard to get the message out. I honestly believe that the 2016 presidential election had been fixed so that Hillary was supposed to win by a landslide. The problem is was that so many people came in and voted for Trump that even with the fractionalized vote counting and all of the other goofy math that was programmed into the voting machines, the support for Trump was just so overwhelming in actual number of votes cast and the number of votes cast for Hillary were so small that even the best computer programming and fractionalized vote counting to rig an election just wasn't enough because Hillary got that few votes. But one thing that I think was the result of that is that the people who do those things also learned how to make sure that the fix would work in the future. Yes, I'm sure they, I'm sure they did. Uh, uh, of course, I, you hear things along a conspiracy line that, you know, they didn't want her because she's she spoiled goods or would, would ruin the program, you know, because she's just so bad, you know, they couldn't countenance her. And so they settled for Trump and, and try to undermine him, which they're doing, you know, anyway. And so he's a one-termer and he's just a, 
a blip here in the in the movement toward a communist state. So uh, you know, they, they try to they're going to try to impeach him or kill him before his term is up. So, you know, before uh, maybe even before the next election cycle, two thousand what two thousand this year, two thousand eighteen coming up so, to. Uh, Stir the pot so the Democrats can get more votes. They, 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 it's, it's very, very unsettling that in Virginia uh, the Republicans fared very badly in the last elections, and that's because we have all the immigrants coming into Northern Virginia who just vote as a block for the Democrats. I don't know what we can do about that. Not much, I'm afraid. You know, the Bible tells us that we overcome evil with good. You have to stick with what you're doing and and fight the evil too. You just can't let them carry on like they do. They they have no intention of backing down or being nice about it. So we have to fight fire with fire. That's what I think. And, and so, given the fact that there is so much evil, and again, as I said before, I had no conception before Trump was elected president that evil was even capable of being evil to the degree that it has been in the last year. What good things do we need to be doing to overcome that evil? Uh, we have to have, uh, live moral lives. I think uh, you know, don't don't give in. Keep a uh, close family relationship going. Continue uh, going to our churches. Uh, I, I think we should join patriotic groups, including nationalist groups. I think that's a very important. We think we should join nationalist groups and support them and be active in them, and, and uh, try to raise the consciousness of our. Uh, Whites who, you know, just seem to be unaware of what's going on, or actually hostile to to our patri, you know, our patriotic way of doing things, from guilt, from which has been instilled by the media to make them hate themselves. Basically, we do have a lot of positive material in our publications, besides just complaining about what's going on. You know, we, there's new groups and new internet sites coming out all the time that we should hook up with. American Renaissance is an old-time group that is very intellectual. The leader, Jared Taylor, is, is, is nobody can accuses him of being violent or a hater because he's a college professor and he talks that kind of talk, you know, and and, and never raises his voice. That's the way we got to be. We got to just if we're going to have a dialogue with anybody, not get mad or. Uh, just pursue our way of thinking and just express it and not, and not feel shameful over it. That's what it comes down to. Just feel confident in what we're saying. No. Well, that's, that's definitely good advice. Um, so how does someone subscribe to the Citizens Informer? How do they get a hold of it? The paper itself has an application on page two, and we have a brochure that you can use. It, it the cost is thirty six dollars for one year and sixty dollars for two years, and one can actually subscribe to the paper without becoming a member. But of course, we prefer people become a member, but in which case they get the paper automatically. But one uh, one can get the paper independently of being a member. So can someone type in Citizens Informer into Google and find a website and subscribe and join that way? Well, this, they can look up the website cfcc us let me uh, or the conservative headlines dash us site comes up and we have daily news uh, for, uh, from the us and around the world about all kinds of and and uh, i'm looking at it right now there's a thing about we honored james comey with a highly coveted man of the year award last year that was a tongue-in-cheek award this is a print publication so is there a way that somebody could subscribe by mail, maybe mail you a check and not have to do so on the Internet at all? I send a check of money order for $36 made out to Conservative Citizens to the PC, Box 250 or 250, Potosi, P-O-T-O-S-I, Missouri, 63664. It's Box 250, Potosi, Missouri, 63664. So as we're getting toward the end of our time, uh, just to kind of wrap things up a little bit, uh, give us a little summary, if you will, or just kind of where everything is headed. I, I guess it's going to come down to balkanization of the country in the end, if it continues like it is, especially if the Democrats get control in the next couple of elections. You know, and they're they're just getting worse and worse all the time. It, it seems that way. And if we get an extreme person like uh, Bernie Sanders in there, there's no telling what we're going to have to put up with. 
even Elizabeth Warren is going to be some um, should probably be worse than Hillary. So I don't know what we're going to do. I'm I'm pretty sure they want a woman to be the president next time, but we haven't had one yet. Bernie could have been worse than Hillary. I don't think so. But do you think he could have no, been? Prob- probably not. But he, he has some sense. He he does have some sense. I mean, he does. Ha- he's capable of reason and compromise. But I don't think she is. You're right about that. Yes. I mean, I'll I'll uh, I'll just put it out there. If I had to choose between Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders, if those were the only two choices, I would have been a Bernie voter. Yeah, I would too. Obama is just just a, a puppet of the people in control. I mean, if he didn't have a teleprompter, he's lost. I think, really. Uh, I, I've read stories that he's he was coached from an early age, from about 1990 or so on, by by. Uh, but first, by the Russian communists, and when Russia fell, he, other people were, were were kind of developing him as a future presidential candidate, and, and he was going to do whatever they told him to do, and that's basically what he's what he did. You know, he didn't have any sense at all about race relations; just inflamed them, and he just uh, did everything he could to just upset everything. You know, to choose uh, judges who. Wanted to reinterpret uh, the law and not go by the Constitution, and, and you know uh, approve such things as same-sex marriage, and it just boggles the mind. So, I mean, I don't think he did anything that one could uh, approve of or be proud of. So we've definitely talked a lot about the Democrats. Any quick comments on President Trump? We're moving in the right direction. I think President Trump has started the ball rolling. It might take a long time to do what we have to do, but without him, we would have just continued along the same road toward, toward oblivion. I, I think we're, we at least have the, the beginnings of, of uh, a movement to, to change things as, they're, as, they're, as they are right now. I, I think we're, we're, in the event we're going to have leaders who lead us in the right direction, we, you know, we just don't know who they, they're going to be, but uh, we, we hope we can only be optimistic. We can't give up. We have to keep on doing what we're doing right now. I think we're about out of time here, but I've definitely enjoyed the conversation. It's been one of our subscribers that I've wanted to kind of get to know for a while now, so this gave me a chance to do that a little bit, and I'm glad to have done that. If I'm I... glad that, that you, know, uh, you know, we're not just talking about Southern issues, we're about national issues as well, you know, so you know, all the issues that affect us as Americans. If I... Uh, you know, we need to get people off of uh, one one issue uh, focuses or foci or whatever, like abortion, gun control, uh, wh- whatever it is that uh, we're concerned about. We need to be concerned about all these various issues that affect us, you know, in a comprehensive way. Well, I, I definitely have enjoyed the chat. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, God bless you, Sid. Great. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I want to thank Sid Secular for being my guest today. I also want to thank each and every one of you, our listeners, who've tuned in today. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope that you'll tune in again next week and become a regular follower of our Dixie Heritage podcast. I'd also like to give you a copy of my best-selling book, The Truth About the Confederate Battle Flag, absolutely free. The reason I'm giving away a best-selling book is because our heritage is under attack like never before. The good names of my ancestors are under attack like never before. And so I decided about two and a half years ago that I was just going to start giving the book away for free to anybody who wanted to read it. And so all you have to do is give me your email address. You don't have to give me your credit card. You don't have to give me your postal address. You don't have to give me your telephone number. Just give me a valid email address, and I'll have an electronic copy, a PDF of the book, The Truth About the Confederate Battle Flag, delivered right to your mailbox so that you can read it on your Kindle, on your smartphone, on your tablet, or on your computer screen. When you sign up for the book, you'll also receive a copy of my free weekly newsletter, The Dixie Heritage Letter. Uh, that's just chocked full of information every week that you'll look forward to reading. And again, absolutely free, no cost, no obligation. All you have to do is go to our website, www.dixieheritage.net, www.dixieheritage.net, 
and you'll see the form to enter your email address. If you've got a Facebook account, at Dixie Heritage Letter, like us on Facebook. Uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Until next week, God bless.